The reason why I wrote my book is because I wanted to show people that if this old hippie can do it, anybody can do it. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 19. In this episode, I interview Dr. Vernon Saluzniak, the author of GED to PhD, Reaching Higher, a book that details his journey from a high school dropout to college campus president. While serving in the military, Vernon attended night school to complete his BA and MA. When he retired as an officer from the U.S. Coast Guard after 20 years of service, he got the bug to return to school and completed his Ph.D. in Computing Technology in Education from Nova Southeastern University in 1998. He has been involved in the leadership and education field for over 30 years in faith-based, academic, biomedical, healthcare, consulting, government, and military organizations. He has been working with doctoral students for over 20 years. Vernon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I would love to start with you telling your story of how someone who really wasn't what, how shall we say it, a nerd and loving school, how is it that you go from that to a college president? Well, it's, it's quite interesting because my parents uh, never, they worked so much that they really never had time to be part of our education. They never went to any of my concerts when I played in band or anything like that. And so therefore I grew up where to me, school was not really important. I never ever dreamt that I would ever go to college, much less get a PhD one day, which is kind of crazy. But the important thing for me is that around 16, 16 and a half, I accepted uh, God as my personal savior. And that's when things really changed. And I realized, you know, that there's more to life than just getting down on myself and feeling negative and so forth like that, feeling like a failure when I can do anything that I want to set my mind to. By having God in my life, that was a catalyst that helped me propel forward to be able to finish my dissertation and to what God has done in my life in the different positions that I've had and the different opportunities that I've had to help other people become successful. Because as a chair, if my, if my students are successful, then I was successful through the help of my God, my higher power. And so I wanted to write this book because number one, I wanted people to see that they can overcome so many obstacles in life by allowing their God, allowing their strength, and their perseverance to reach their goals. And you know, one of the things that's interesting that I put in my book was reaching higher. The Latin for reaching higher is altus tendo. And when I was in the Coast Guard, I went to the Chiefs Academy, which is a special school for chiefs. And that was the motto was altus tendo. So that was kind of cool because I always encourage my students to reach higher, to reach that point where they can make a difference in somebody's life. And so that's kind of where I came from. And so you found strength in a source outside yourself. Mm -hmm. And did that happen before you joined the military? Yes. Yes, it did. It happened probably a year before I joined the military. And then while you were serving our country, and thank you for your service. Thank you. You had the opportunity to enroll in some classes that allowed you to complete your GED. That's correct. What happened was I was newly married in 1975 and I got stationed in Corpus Christi, Texas on a ship. And my captain calls me up to the bridge and he says, uh, hey, Ski, we have this uh, message that came in for the school called Educational Enrichment Program. 
And so I said, well, Captain, what's that about? He says, well, I really don't know what the school is about. He says, but it sounds good, like something that you could probably use to help in your career here in the military. So I said, well, let me talk to my wife and and see what she says. And so the next day I went back and I said, Captain, let's go. Let's go for it. I don't know what it is, but let's go for it. God is so awesome. What that was, was a preparatory school for the GED. And I was, I was blown away when I was in this class for six weeks to get prepared for the GED. And then by the time I got back to the boat, our education officer had already ordered my GED, which I took and I passed in 1976. So being open to these opportunities, here was this opportunity. You weren't even sure what it was, but there was this bigger plan that you were a part of and you willingly went along. But once you started that, we were talking before the show, being in school wasn't easy for you. And your wife had a very interesting idea that really helped you out that I think would be something that a lot of our listeners might be able to use. Do you want to share that technique? Sure. What happened was in the military back then, you had to take correspondence courses in order to promote from one uh, rank to another. I ordered my courses and in my little apartment, I had this office in a closet and my wife would see me just laboring over that work and I would read it and read it over and over and over and I couldn't comprehend nor could I retain information. So She saw me really agonizing over the coursework. So she comes up to me and she says, honey, why don't we save up some money and buy a cassette recorder? And that way you can record the question, you can answer the question, and then you can listen to the answer that you recorded. And that was really genius because it helped me to be able to move forward with understanding the material It's crazy how your life is changed just by a simple technique. Today, I love mind mapping. I've been doing mind mapping over 20 years because it creates that knowledge of linking a word to a picture, a graphic, or a symbol that actually creates it in your brain, that connection, which you'll never forget. And you know, Vernon, I love these techniques because I know a lot of people are auditory learners. When we were talking before the show and you mentioned this technique, I remembered when I was in high school, I did the same exact thing, but I hadn't even thought about that until you brought it up. I would literally record myself reading my notes into a cassette and listen to myself. And I had completely forgotten about that. And mind mapping to create these visual connections. Is there a program that you recommend that you use? Yeah, it's called Mind Mapper. And I learned the technique when I was the training director at Water and Sewer Department for Miami Dade County. And once I learned mind mapping, it was crazy because it made so much sense. I'm both an auditory and a visual learner. And so once I learned this technique, when I was at Capella University, I was the lead for the colloquia experiences where we helped students prepare for their dissertations. I taught a course on mind mapping to the doctoral students, and it was it was incredible, incredible. I have used that myself in residencies. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how you use mind mapping, how you instruct students to use that in terms of working towards their dissertation. Sure. I did a PowerPoint presentation, and I took them through the process of how to mind map, and I would have them get into small groups, and they would mind map one of the proposals that they were working on during the colloquial experience. They would do a poster session, and a lot of the sessions were created in the mind mapping class. I'll share this with you, Heather, is that before I wrote my book, I mind mapped my entire book first. I had every section, every chapter mind mapped, and then every uh, subsection mind mapped as well. So once I finished the mind map of my book, that's when I started writing my book. Now, not everybody likes mind mapping. The people who are very rigid, very linear, they hate mind mapping because you have to use the the other side of the brain. And you know what? As you were talking, I was thinking there may be some people listening who aren't even sure what the heck is a mind map. 
So maybe we should back up a little bit. And how would you describe a mind map? Because you're right. If you're a real black and white person, the mind map invites these shades of gray. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. Well, a mind map, the first thing that you do is the center piece of the mind map is what your topic is about. So if my dissertation is on a computer-based training program for bloodborne pathogens, then that would be my center. And then the first branch off of it would be the program itself. So what is the program created in? Well, back then I used a CBT program called Asymmetrics. And then after you outline the software application, you outline the topic areas that you want in the bloodborne pathogens, then what does each topic include? So each one of the topics is its own branch. But the key to mind mapping is not just the lines and the bubbles, it's the connection of the word to a symbol, picture, graphic, or color. For instance, if I was to ask you, Heather, what does the color blue mean to you? The ocean, clearing, being in my flow, it's cool. Who told you that? Somebody told you that blue means this, right? They, they said that the ocean was blue. And so your brain made that connection of blue to the ocean. And that's why mind maps are so powerful because it creates a physical connection in your brain of blue being connected to the ocean, to calmness and so forth. And I think one of the reasons this can be such a powerful tool is when you get to that stage, it's quite messy. And maybe before we get to the dissertation or the doctoral project, we're used to things being very clear. Here's a paper I write. Here's a discussion posting. Here's a presentation I give. And then we get to this stage and it gets very, very complex and complicated. And this mind mapping is almost like this free association brain dump where you start seeing visually the connection so that you can organize yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the key things I want people to understand is that a dissertation is not just an assignment paper. This is an academic piece of work. And I, I, I hate to say this, and I tell all my students this, when you're writing your dissertation, nobody cares about what you have to say in your dissertation until you get your doctorate. <laughs> People want to read your dissertation because they want to see what the experts are saying, not what you're saying, but what the experts are saying about your specific topic. So this is something that I know there's a lot of struggle, especially in the proposal stage or when you're even just generating that very basic idea. I'll get a lot of papers where students are telling me, this is what I want to prove, or I know this is the case and I'm going to create a study to do this. And wait, hang on. You need to back up because you're creating a piece of a puzzle in a larger framework. All the science that came before you needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. that's, right? that's so true. Exactly. And so the first thing that the student tries to do, and I've been doing this for a long time, the, the first thing that they try to do is to solve a problem that has no problem. So they're trying to do a dissertation with no problem. And a lot of times they get confused by what the problem is compared to the purpose. So they yeah. think that the purpose is the problem. But then you have to ask them, do you remember the old commercial, where's the beef? Yeah. That's what we ask, where's the beef? What is the problem? And the other thing that the students do is trying to defend what they think is the answer when you don't do that in a study. All you're doing is looking at the data and reporting on the data. That's all you're doing. You're not trying to say that your, what you thought was going to happen is going to happen. <laughs> right. You're not setting out to prove something. You're asking a question and then seeing what do the data suggest in terms of what the answer might be, right? right? Because it's just a probability. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that I always told my students was, think about this. A brick wall has bricks in it, right? And every brick there is knowledge. Well, there's one little brick missing there in that wall. And so your dissertation is to fill that brick in that wall. And that's all you're doing is filling one little piece of knowledge on that wall. 
All you're doing is making one small acknowledgement in there with your dissertation. And I think if you have this image of a really, really big brick wall and each brick is really tiny, it even will help the student more because what we're doing again is contextualizing, here's what the field knows in your area. Yeah. And I always recommend that students look in the end of the abstract or the discussion section where the researchers before them have said, okay, so now here's what this study has contributed. Here's what we still don't know. That's probably your brick. You don't come with your brick, right? No, no, the no. field before shows here's the hole. Now no. we need you to go create a, a study that will make this brick. Yeah. And Heather, you hit it right, the nail right on the head. I tell my students in the orientation, I say to them, let me tell you, I'm going to give you your cake and I'm going to give you the frosting on top of that cake. And here it is. You can find your topics either in a journal or go to chapter five in the dissertation and it says recommended research. Look in there. And all you have to do is change one variable from their dissertation and you have a perfectly ethical dissertation. Right, because again, we talk a lot about on this podcast how this final doctoral capstone is supposed to demonstrate to the academy that you are worthy of these letters after your name, right? That's it's right. simply right. a demonstration project showing you know how to read research, you know how to synthesize research, analyze research, and create research. And cite it. And, and cite, cite it appropriately. It. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Do you want to shift to this idea of citing? Sure. Um, and the struggles it, that people oh, have with that? Oh my gosh. It, you know, one of the things that we did, Heather, is at St. Thomas University, we have a course called Foundations of Research. So what they do is they go through the different topics of the pre-proposal. And then at the end, we have a template that we've created that has the topic, has the problem, has the purpose. They have to do annotated bibliography for the literature and then the methodology. They're building each week that template. So by the time they finish the eight-week course, they will have their pre-proposal already done. And then we created a rubric that shows every area that needs to be included in every section of every chapter. And it's amazing how even though you put in the rubric, you must cite the information about your methodology, about your research design, about your sampling methods, about anything that doesn't come out of your head, it must be cited in some way or fashion. And you know, this is something that I have seen at a lot of universities and a lot of the faculty that I've had on this show will say, hey, if you're listening to this, your university probably has a template. Take the time to find it and mm -hmm. use it. It's yeah. there to support you. It's almost like following a recipe. Make sure you can check the boxes. It's going to say reference. That's right. Methodological technique, right? Yes, exactly. And I remember when I first went to Nova Southeastern, my chair, she was incredible. Dr. Abramson, when I asked her to be my chair, she says, I want to tell you one thing. She says, if I'm chairing your dissertation, you have to promise me that you're going to be successful. And I told her, I said, Dr. Abramson, I'm going to work hard to finish my dissertation. And I finished my dissertation in one year after my coursework was completed. I set my goal and that was working full time still in the Coast Guard. And what's crazy about it is that I remember her saying, OK, well, go write your pre-proposal. I said, what? <laughs> what's a pre-proposal? <laughs> so back then we had to go to the brick and mortar library and I started going through all the dissertations that she had approved to find out her flow. And so I was able to look at different proposals that were approved by her as well. And that's how I was able to finish my proposal. But now we give students everything. They have so many resources available to them to finish a doctorate. And, and I think sometimes there's this expectation that you need to go out and create something totally new. And maybe there's this idea that I shouldn't just be following this template, right? And so this idea of 
taking the resources that your university, that your chair gives you and using them and then asking questions if you're stuck, right? I think exactly. both of us have worked with students where weeks will go by. And when we finally reach out and say, what's going on, they're stuck, but they didn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. asking the question. Like this was something they should already know how to do. Well, you know, one of the things that I found over the years, Heather, is that here are the students doing their coursework, right? And coursework is very structured. It has a process. It has discussion threads. It has assignments and so forth. Then they get to the dissertation stage and bam, oh, it's the black hole because there's no assemblance of that in the dissertation courses. And what we've done is because of regulatory requirements and also attendance requirements, we are requiring our dissertation students to answer a discussion question once a week. And this discussion question deals with what do you commit that you're going to do this week? Number two, what can I do as your chair to help you get unstuck? Number three, is there a time that we need to create for Zoom meeting so we can reconnect and so forth? And so we feel that if when you go from the coursework into the dissertation work, there's more of a transition where there's going to be some kind of a format and some a semblance to build that interaction with their chair even more. And we know that research suggests the relationship with the chair is a huge predictor of whether or not someone completes the degree. And it's yes. both building the relationship with those questions that you gave, but also creating some accountability. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Right? Exactly. That accountability falls on the student. The chair is yeah. not going to write your dissertation. The chair is going to guide you they're going to laugh with you when you're going to laugh. They're going to cry with you when you're going to cry. And one of the things that I found also, Heather, so, so beneficial in technology is being able to text my students. I yeah. say, listen, text me if you have any problems, any situations, and they'll text me. We'll pray together. We'll cry together. We'll laugh together. I mean, it's incredible the relationship that you build with your students. And the relationship that you build is a relationship that lasts forever. And you know, this relationship's going to vary from chair to chair to student to student, just like yes. any relationship yes. that we see around us, right? So you mentioned texting. I also will ask my students to text me, but some people may not be into that. And I think there are different ways to communicate. And it's just so important to find out, to, to be honest with yourself and candid with your chair about the type of communication, how you like to receive feedback, find out what their preferences are so that you can create this relationship. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And here's another thing. Is every chair good for every student? And the answer is no. We have students that cannot connect with a certain chair and they'll uh, send in a, a chair request form, change form, and I'll first check with the chair and see how things are going and what, what transpired. And then I'll make a decision whether we'll move that student to another chair. It's kind of like I'm working with this person I don't feel connected to this person and I'm really not getting anywhere because I'm dropping out. And so when you give a new chair the opportunity that it's, it's a, a fresh air, it's a new person, it's an opportunity to, again, to build a new relationship. And like I said, not every personality is going to be the same with every student. You know, this is such an important point. Mm -hmm. I'd like to spend a little more time on this because like you said, it's not always a great match. And I know there's students who will sing my praises and there are students who couldn't wait to drop me as their chair and find someone else, right? You're just not a great fit for everyone. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the relationship isn't always going to be rosy. So right. let's talk about how can you kind of stack the odds in your favor so that you pick or you get matched with a chair that's going to be more likely to work with you? And then what would the warning signs be that maybe it's time to ask for a change? So let's start with what do we do to make sure we get the best chair for us? We try to match the student to the chair that has the similar subject matter expertise. And again, even though they have the expertise that the student is working in, they still may not be the right match. And so as a student, when you see yourself 
wanting to drop out from what you're doing or you feel that you're lost, raise your hand quickly and say something because you don't want to while in the mire because yeah. the longer time that you while in the mire, you're just going to get further and further behind. So in terms of matching with a chair, the subject matter is a great way to go because it's something that you know, you as the student and the chair are both passionate about this topic and you're gonna be speaking the same language, right? Mm -hmm. That makes things easier. But then with the personality differences, I know I've worked with some universities where they encourage the student to reach out over email and maybe even ask for a phone call with different potential chairs so that they can maybe feel if there's a better match. I like that. That's a, that's a great way. I think that that would be really, really great. Then when things get tough and you feel like you're dropping out and listen, I, I haven't interviewed a faculty member yet who hasn't said at some point I wanted to drop out. It's somewhat normal that you're going to feel like I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a change in a chair will help. Do you recommend sharing these feelings with the chair and coming oh. to that decision together? Oh, yes, by all means, by all means. Don't shoot and then aim. You want to aim and then shoot. By that, I mean, really sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your chair. Explain to them your method of learning and what way you accept feedback the most. Heather, I think one of the most important aspects of a doctoral project is that the student must understand that it's an iterative process, back and forth back and forth, and they're going to get feedback all the way through. And so you need to expect that you're going to get written feedback from your chair. You're going to get verbal feedback from your chair. And sometimes your chair has to say, stop crying and move on. You know, you need to put your, your big boy pants or big girl pants on because this is an arduous process. If a dissertation was easy, everybody would have one. Yeah, that's right. And this iterative process is something that we're not used to seeing the same paper we've written for literally years, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually on a, a Twitter string right now where someone posted, I read my dissertation a gazillion times. I just submitted it to my committee and I just found a typo. Yeah. And I said, guess what? It's never perfect. That's it's right. never perfect. There's always going to be something that can be revised. I remember being so excited at my oral defense. I left the room. I came back after the committee deliberated and they said, great job. We're, we're fine awarding your degree here, but we actually want you to add this new subsection in chapter one. And I couldn't believe I was going to have to add something to chapter one. Yeah. Yeah. After I just spent years on this project. Exactly. That's for sure. So we have talked about developing this relationship with the chair where you're really candid with each other and you're having these heart to heart talks. I'd love for you to talk about any advice you have for students in terms of not feeling alone on this journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important that number one, if you guys are in a cohort, that you interact with your cohort, that you build relationship with your peers. So building a support system of peers is something that you also see as a very critical factor in terms of completion. Yeah. And one of the things that I do, Heather, in our orientations is I'll invite some of my graduates into the orientation to uh, kind of address the, the new students and to be there available to any of their questions. Like one of my my first doctoral students at St. Thomas University, I, I hired him as an adjunct faculty because he was so open to help other students. He was always there giving feedback and recommendations to the new students. And I said, man, this guy is awesome. So I hired him as an adjunct and now he's doing committee work and chair work. So we've got mind mapping, following templates, building the relationship with your chair, building a peer support network. Any final words of wisdom or a favorite quote that you like to share with your students? I would like to say to them that if they haven't read my book, GED to PhD, Reaching Higher, if you feel that you're stuck, if you feel that you can't do it, you can read my book. And the reason why I wrote my book is because I wanted to show people that if this old hippie can do it, 
Anybody can do it. I did a virtual commencement to a GED graduate school in Philadelphia. And if you go into YouTube and type in Saluzniak commencement, you'll be able to see my commencement speech kind of revolving around my book. And that might help you uh, decide whether you want to buy my book or, or reach out. I will find that YouTube and put it in the show notes to make it easy for the listeners. You're also on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and put that link as well. So thank you so much for taking time today and sharing your perspectives on moving from coursework to the completed degree and everything in between. Oh, it's really been an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. The Happy Doc Student Podcast is brought to you by expandyourhappy.com and you can learn more there. Oh, and hey, if you want to make my day, would you rate, review, and subscribe to the show? Before I sign off, I do need to remind you, the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk.